And I'm thrilled and honored to be joined by sitting U.S. Senator from Nevada, Catherine Cortez Masto. Senator Cortez Masto, thank you so much for being here. I am so excited to join you and be on your podcast. I have to admit, I'm not normally nervous for political interviews because I do so many of them. But this is cool for our little show that we launched back in February. A uh, big milestone for us, you know, to having a, a sitting U.S. Senator. Not only that, one that made history, the first Latina in the U.S. Senate, Nevada's first female senator. So we're just we're honored to have you on. We really appreciate you making the time. Well, listen, let me just say thank you for doing this. I've listened to some of your your podcasts. It's it's informational for the people here in, in Nevada. And I thank you for doing it. Of course. You've we're done a good job. Do thank you so much. That, that means, means you're going to go easy on me now that I've. Well, I can't commit to that. All right. Absolutely All not. Right. Well, <laughs> first question. Uh, you're not running for a race this year. Mm -hmm. Are you relieved that, you know, you have time to do things like podcasts and whatnot and go to pool openings now that you're not running a really tight campaign? Well, you know, it, it is true that when you're uh, when you're off the election year, for me, it, it really I get to focus on the policy. I get to focus on bringing resources to the community, getting out and spending time throughout the state and talking to people about what we need and what what's we can do together and what I can focus on when I'm in Washington. So and then you get to come back and say, OK, we we got these resources and oh, my gosh, here's what we've done together. So the the new aquatics facility that yeah. was just at earlier today at Moana, you know, I was able to get eight hundred thousand dollars for the solar piece of that. So it is it is important to be around and be involved in the community, and I love it. It's just great to be home and be able to to work with in you know, public private partnerships and work with with our community members. I was going to ask you next. I mean, what have you been up to? Uh, you, as you mentioned, we're at the Man Moana Pool opening on Tuesday as we're recording this at Home Depot at Labor Fest. What have you been up to? Because you've been in Nevada, Northern Nevada, I should say, for several days now. Yeah, we just had our senior fair. I was over there at the senior fair today talking with our seniors, looking at, um, you know, the, the, the vendors that are there, the opportunities for our seniors. A lot of the work I do is around senior health care, ensuring that our seniors um, really have access to affordable health care. I sit on Senate Finance, so that has oversight over Medicare, right? So the cutting... Uh, uh, you know, let me just say, uh, part of that was ensuring that our seniors have access to vaccines for free. I go to the Senior Fest, and sure enough, there is a line where seniors are standing in line getting those vaccines. Yeah. And it's great to see, you know, the work that we, we get to do together to, to benefit our community. And that's what it's all about, really. And, and it's exciting for me, and that's why I love to do what I'm doing. Yeah. Let's talk 2024, because uh, you were fresh off the trip to Chicago a few weeks ago for the DNC, but a lot happened to lead up to you speaking at Kamala Harris's convention instead of Joe Biden's convention. So you were publicly supportive of Joe Biden, but I have to ask what your reaction to watching that debate was, because you, after the fact, as people were um, working behind the scenes, maybe to push him out, you said, you know, it's time for Nevadans to, to stand with Joe Biden. What made you say that after the debate? A, a, a couple of things. One, he was our, and still is, our sitting president. He's done incredible uh, things for this country, both on foreign affairs, but uh, but also domestically. You know, I, I just talked about free vaccines for seniors. A lot of that came because Joe Biden signed the legislation and pushed for that legislation, cutting costs of insulin, right? Uh, making sure there's more money in our seniors' pockets. It's just everything that we have done in this state from the bipartisan infrastructure package to bring more clean energy jobs to, uh, to Nevadans um, and focus on how we reduce our carbon footprint at the same time growing our economy because of the legislation. That was Joe Biden uh, and Kamala Harris working with us on those. So it is, I will just say this, I, I thought the process itself was horrific. Um, the outcome was probably the outcome that that I think many of us thought uh, at the end of the day um, was going to happen. But the process and in, in how it was handled, I was not supportive of it. Mm -hmm. I was supportive and will always be supportive of Joe Biden. He's done oh. incredible work. I think he will go down in history uh, as a, a, one of the presidents who has done so much for this country and actually change the trajectory of our economy and creating jobs and bringing manufacturing and jobs back to this country. He will also go down in history as somebody who united a lot of our allies around the world at a time that was essential for us to build and keep those relationships. And you say horrific referring to 
Democratic leaders the public process. pushing him out, essentially? No, or? it was just the public process. I think, you know, from my perspective, if, if you... If anyone had a concern about uh, Joe Biden after that debate, and listen, it was a bad debate. Everybody could see it. We all saw it. Sure. But then tell him. <laughs> talk to him. And if yeah. you have access to him, then you tell him a and talk to him about it. Don't make it public. Don't go write an op-ed about it. Yeah. Particularly if you're an individual that knows him, that has the ability to talk to him and explain it to him. Uh, and I think I thought that to me uh, was the horrific part of it. If you, if you have the ability to talk to him and you have access to him, then I explain to him and go and talk to him about it. That's, that's where I thought it was just a bad process all around. I will give you credit because I think oftentimes politicians are known for and disliked for saying one thing publicly and saying a different thing privately. You were tweeting, you know, it's time to have President Biden's back. And then there was this New York Times story several days ago that, you know, behind the scenes as well, you were kind of resisting these efforts, saying it could create chaos, that the party would be better off avoiding. I mean, did you not want there to be kind of an open process where everything was, he was out and the party might not have united behind Harris and just kind of the chaos that that could potentially create with a couple months left to the election? No, I think it's very clear. And I think I even, I, I, I think I heard John Ralston say this um, after the fact on, on your podcast. It's very clear by the time that Joe Biden, by the way, stepped down, it was his decision to step down. We got to remember, it was his decision all along is to stay in or step down. And it was his decision to step down. By that time, it was too late to go to some sort of uh, convention where we were going to figure out who was going to be our next leader. The ticket was Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Um, the next logical step is because we elected them as a ticket, we elected her vice president, we elected her to, to be in line should something happen to the president of the United States. The next logical step was, all right, if he steps down, then Kamala Harris is the one that we all get behind sure. and support. What's your relationship with Kamala Harris like? You mentioned in your speech at the DNC that you guys go way back to serving as attorney g attorneys general, is the correct plural there, uh, in California and Nevada. When did you first meet her? What did, issues did you guys work on? I first met her. I was attorney general, and she was running for attorney general in California. Um, and uh, we just hit it off. And as she became the attorney general, we were able to walk, work on a number of issues that Nevada and California have in common, just because we're border states. A lot of what happens, um, and I mean borders, we share a border, sure, right, yeah. in Lake Tahoe. <laughs> uh, and a lot of what happens in California sometimes bleeds into Nevada and vice versa. So we just had a lot in common, particularly as Western state AGs, from drought issues to fire issues to land issues. So uh, we just hit it off and we're able to work together um, to solve problems that we were dealing with in our in our states, uh, and that through that developed a friendship uh, and a bond, and just uh, think so highly of her and know that she is capable. Like the fact that she's a Westerner, so she gets our Western issues, and I know what she has fought for in the past, uh, and, and know that that's what she carries with her. I think the rest of the country now is seeing the Kamala Harris that I n have known. Um, she's just never had the ability to um, be at the forefront because, quite honestly, as vice president, that's not your job, mm -hmm, right. right? Your job yeah. is to just support be the there and support yeah. the president, and it's, it's the president's decision what policies you're going to take and how you're going to move forward and how much the president wants you as vice president to be involved. What's something that the public might not know or understand about her that you, having gone back many years with her, do? Yeah, I think you're seeing it now. She's, she cares, and she's a compassionate person. And she really cares, and she's a true believer in ensuring that our working families have every opportunity. She fights for our family. She fights for them and their future. Uh, that's what she has done, I know, as attorney general. I've watched her do it as senator, and now you see that coming out as she's running now to be the next president is this idea. And it comes, as you can see, from her background and her upbringing that there, everybody should have an opportunity, which you call an opportunity economy. Everybody should have that opportunity to succeed, and that's what she works towards. Hmm. The Review Journal reported that you were on the vetting team to kind of uh, maybe speak with or at least dig deeper on some of the vice presidential candidates. And did you, were you advocating for Tim Walls behind the scenes? What was kind of your involvement in that process? No, listen, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, it was Kamala Harris's decision. Uh, the vetting uh, that went on, uh, and I was 
absolutely honored to be a part of it and asked to be a part of it. Um, but the vetting was to uh, really interview the candidates, look at their backgrounds, uh, talk to them, ask, answer those questions, uh, figure out uh, as part of the vetting team um, their strengths, the challenges that they might have on the ticket, and then share that with the Vice President Harris. Um, and then she actually would make a decision uh, based on that information, based on her interviews, her kind of meeting with them and figuring out from, from her perspective um, how she felt uh, was the best candidate to be with her and, and, and taking into consideration the work that we did as a vetting team. But it was her decision at the end of the day. What's your involvement with the campaign moving forward? You know, I, I will say this. I am very focused on Nevada and Jackie Rosen and making sure that at the end of the day, not only does Jackie Rosen win and that we actually hold the Senate as Democrats because there's so much on, on the line and we can go into that, but there's yeah. so much uh, at stake, but also our, our, our delegation and making sure that um, our delegation is returned to uh, Congress to continue the work that we've done for Nevada as, as a whole. I know you're focused on Nevada, but your name always gets floated around when we're talking about higher offices, a cabinet position, U.S. Attorney General, for example. Any interest in that position? Listen, I am very that? honored to have my name floated out there, but I, <laughs> you know, I, I run in Nevada because I'm, I believe in Nevada. This is what people elected me to do. I just got reelected to my second term, honored to represent this state. Uh, and um, it's what the voters have asked me to do and sending me back and, and fighting for them in Washington. And I am just love the, the job and want to continue in, in, as long as our Nevada voters will have me. It's not a denial. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, as I mentioned in the intro, you know, Nevada's first female senator. Nevada has a majority female legislature in Carson City. Kamala Harris, the first woman vice president. You think America is ready for a female president? Yes. Uh, and I do think um, at the end of the day, we are seeing across the country more women activated than ever. And why is it? Well, obviously, it's because uh, of the overturning of Roe versus Wade and the Dobbs decision that has taken away women's rights and freedoms in this country when it comes to reproductive freedom. Um, the challenges that we are facing there is one of the, I think, the key motivators for so many across the country, and particularly mm -hmm. women to stand up and fight for their rights and their freedoms. Uh, and, uh, and we see it in Nevada, but we see it across the country. And I, I will say this, it's fa fascinating to me. People always talk to me about, well, Nevada's, you know, you're protected. You had a ballot in 1990s, but sure. text Nevada. And I said, people of Nevada, by the way, uh, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, nonpartisan, a man or a woman, we all believe, at least, almost two thirds of us, right? Mm -hmm. That women should have the right to choose. And that's no different than the rest of the country. And so you see now people coming out and saying, no, they, we're, we're gonna push back. We are gonna fight for these freedoms for women across the country that it's treat, they're treated equally across the country. Uh, and it shouldn't matter wh what state you live in, whether you have access to 21st century medicine for your reproductive needs. And so you see a lot of that playing out across the country. Abortion, a huge issue, of course, in the Senate race that is happening in Nevada this cycle. Your colleague, Junior Senator Jackie Rosen, running against Sam Brown, the Republican nominee, of course. You won the closest Senate race in the country in 2022. I don't have to remind you of that. 8,000-some votes. You probably know the 7, exact 7, number. 7,928. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> so less than 8,000 votes. It delivered the Senate for Democrats two years ago. You have experience in very close races. What would your advice be for Jackie Rose in this cycle? Well, let me just say, Nevada's traditionally been close races. That's, that's who we are. We are a swing state. Uh, and, and I tell people, you got to remember, Harry Reid won a, an election by just 400 votes. Mine was a landslide <laughs> compared to his, <laughs> right. right? They've traditionally been close races in the state uh, and at, at all levels. Uh, and I do think that is important for people to understand because it is a swing state and we are Nevadans. We, we, we actually look to hopefully uh, elect those that we truly believe are going to be looking out for the best interests of Nevada. I don't have to tell Jackie that because she already does that. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with her as a senator. 
not only does she get around the state like I do and travels throughout Nevada in our rural communities and shows up, she follows up and she brings back. She fights for those resources. Listen, we were just, I was just at the Senior Fest and a lot of seniors were saying thank you for for protecting our mail, make, making mm-hmm. sure the mail yeah. stays here in Reno. Jackie was at the forefront of that fight, right? Uh, taking on the Postmaster General and calling them out. And it just, so I, I've seen her, uh, the work that she does. And as a Nevadan, it makes me proud. And really, at the end of the day, I know she's looking out for Nevada's interests and making sure that everybody has that opportunity here in Nevada. That's what I truly believe in. And that's how she believes and ha- how she has acted and operated as a United States Senator. One of the big criticisms and attack lines that we're seeing from Republicans this cycle is that a lot of the spending that was under the Biden administration, whether it's the American Rescue Plan Act, more recently the Inflation Reduction Act, Democrats are going around their various states touting the investments in communities. Republicans would say that's what's contributed to so much inflation and the high prices that we're seeing and making things unaffordable for everyday Nevadans. How would you respond to that? Uh, Those same Republicans then go back to their communities and take credit for the projects that have been created by this funding, even though they didn't vote for it. I mean, that's the hypocrisy in all of this. Um, Listen, I know in in Nevada, just because the work that I do, I grocery shop, I talk to voters here, and I see it in my own family. Uh, And I just, I I use this as an example. I've been home for August recess in in the state getting around. Uh, And one of my aunts, just Aunt Josephine, I'll I'll say who it is. She (laughs) lives in Southern Nevada. She just had a birthday. She's an August birthday. Happy birthday to her. Yeah. And and so there is a family recipe of German chocolate cake, pan German chocolate cake in our family. And my aunt loves it. So a good friend made it for her. And we were having cake and visiting and talking. And we were talking about this very issue, about the the prices at the the grocery store. And... um, uh, Sandy says, as a good friend, she said, you know, what was crazy is that pancake, that recipe, uh, instead of one box of cake mix, it took me two boxes of cake mix to make that same cake pre-COVID mm-hmm. uh, than it would pre-COVID, yeah. and it costs more. Translation, so something yeah. is going on. Call it greedflation. Call it corporates. America coming in, taking advantage of uh, COVID and, and post-COVID to knowing that wages have, to some extent, increased and taking advantage of it because people are willing to pay it, that needs to be called out. And I, I do think there's, that is part of this. So to me, it is we've, we've come uh, far in the sense that we've passed legislation to start helping families reduce costs, right? Child tax credit was put out there, uh, making sure there's more money in people's pockets, taking on big pharma, making them negotiate to lower those costs for families. But more needs to be done. We see it. I feel it. And Kamala Harris feels it. And that's why she has put out those proposals that she has to address the costs that families are feeling because she knows it and sees it in her own family. And and I see it and feel it. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think Donald Trump's ever grocery shopped or has to deal with this issue. And so it is important for people to understand that at the end of the day, whether it's the child tax credit, the earned tax credit, earned income tax credit, or lowering costs, you know, let me just give you one final example we have been able to, with the Biden-Harris administration, this is something that Kamala Harris supports, cap the cost of insulin, right, mm-hmm. at $35. But that's for Medicare. When we actually introduced this legislation, had votes on it, we put a vote on the floor to cap the cost of insulin for everybody in this country. The Republicans opposed it. The Republicans in the Senate supported, did not support it. They voted against it. So that, that is where Kamala ha- Harris's next step is. Okay, we started here with Medicare for seniors for capping the cost of insulin. Now we got to bring it to the rest of the country. That's still the fight for lowering costs for families. She gets it, and I think at the end of the day, we all, as Democrats, we get it. And if if Republicans are willing to work with us to lower those costs, great. Let's do it. Let's solve those problems. But if you're going to play politics with it, just so that you can win a race on on the backs of families who are struggling, then that's just we're going to call you out on it. Let's talk about one uh, rare instance where Democrats and Republicans agree on an economic policy, which is uh, no taxes on tips, initially proposed by President Donald Trump, former president, but um, yourself, Jackie Rosen, and many others on the Democratic side of the aisle have come out in support of this as well. You called it a bluff from him, but you support the proposal. How come? 
couple things. One, I know it's a bluff from him because you got to remember he will say and do anything for a vote. Um, and uh, in 20, when was it? 2016, when I was first running for the United States Senate, mm -hmm. he was running to be president. He's got a hotel down in Las Vegas. Yeah. And he was blocking it from becoming a union organized hotel. We had the culinary picketing out front. I joined them on the picket line. Mm -hmm. He is opposed to organized labor. He's opposed to union. We just heard his comments uh, recently uh, when he was talking with Elon Musk on his podcast. Uh, it is a bluff from his perspective in the sense that he will say or do anything for a political opportunity. Now, with that said, if you're going to come into my state in my service industry and you're going to look at how we reduce costs and keep more money in people's pockets, I'm all for figuring out how we do it. But let's not dangle something in front of them just for political opportunity. Let's actually try to figure out how to get it done. And I think that's Kamala Harris's perspective is, and it's not just one piece of the challenge our families are dealing. It's, I mean, the solution for all of it, it's one piece of it. Right. It's a it's a combination of things that we're doing to to lower costs, to keep more money in their pocket, including addressing the health care costs. Right. And n continuing prescription drug negotiation, continuing the capping of, of costs of insulin, making sure we're bringing back that child tax credit, the earned income tax credit. So those working families can keep more of that money to help with their families and their children. So there's a combination of things that needs to be done. So you're saying it's in conjunction with a number of, of other policies. Absolutely. But let's Absolutely. address one of the criticisms, though, which is that, um, you know, could incentivize employers to shift more of an employee's income into kind of that taxable area and potentially make, you know, wages and income a little more uneven across different job sectors. You know. Well, let me just say a couple of things. There's a sub-minimum wage we have to address in this country that most people don't even realize is happening because it doesn't happen in Nevada, but it happens in other countries. If you make a tip, then you get a sub-minimum wage in some other, excuse me, countries, other states, yeah. right? You get a sub-minimum wage. That's crazy. That is absolutely nonsense. So that needs to be addressed as part of it. I don't hear Donald Trump talking about a sub-minimum wage issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, but I do hear it coming from, from uh, Kamala Harris. I do hear it from uh, others that understand this issue. And so part of this is saying, okay, th if this is an issue that will help us with our families, part of the puzzle of lowering this cost, then we have to understand it. We have to see if there's a way that this can work uh, and, and really address the needs of our working families. Um, putting the proposals out there uh, is one thing. It is another then to work with Congress to figure out what does make sense. And I think that's what Kamala Harris is thinking about and trying to address. I know it's not what Donald Trump is trying to do. Hmm. Let's take through a couple random things mm -hmm. here at the end. Not random, but um, different topics. Washoe's lands bill, for listeners who might not know, freeing up tens of thousands of acres of land, a lot of it east of Sparks for development. It's your colleague Jackie Rosen's bill. Her, you know, She's the main sponsor, right? But you're involved in this. Uh, and you know how the Senate works better better than any of us. Are we running out of time for this session, especially with, you know, the recess and election season and everything? Are we running out of time in, in this Congress? Um, I, I don't think we're running out of time. Uh, the question is, can we, when can we get it done, this Congress or, or next year in the new Congress? Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we are actually working through and finalizing some of the um, particulars in the bill to get it uh, to a point where we can then move forward with a hearing on it at the end of the day. And now, contr who controls the he hearing agenda is leadership, right? Because yeah. there's only so much time. We have to go back. Um, we have about, what, four weeks left, five weeks maybe in the session before um, the election. We still have uh, appropriations bills to get done. We Defense Authorization Act has to be done. Uh, farm bill still has to be worked on and done. So there's a lot on our plate to still move forward and address. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't get uh, lands bills done. And my hope is, as I said on energy and natural resources, that we are getting these all ready in the queue so that we can then have those hearings quickly and then and continue to move them. That's not just Washoe's, that's Clark County's lands bills and a couple of others that are still out there. Do they get wrapped up into the budget bill or in with the other lands bills or passed individually? How does it work? So they actually, so what happens is they do not get wrapped up in appropriations. They're two separate things. Um, and so the goal will be to try to move them 
um, either on their own, preferably as a part of a lands deal, right? Lands package through ENR at the end of the year so that you have not only our lands bills in Nevada, but you have other states and other senators who care about land issues that come from the same committee, ENR, Energy and Natural Resources, that are that have theirs that they want to move. We've, we've done it before at the end of the year where we have just this big lands package and we move it. That That's part of the goal is to just have our lands bills be ready to move no matter what, whether they can move as part of a vehicle, a larger vehicle. It's not going to be appropriations, but it'd be, it could be something else, mm -hmm. or moved at, at the end of the year as part of a lands deal. Gotcha. You mentioned USPS earlier, you know, scuttling their plan to reroute all of our northern Nevada mail through California. What was your reaction to that? And uh, did you think they were going to back down? I talked to Mark Amaday and he said he was thinking he might have to be carried out on a stretcher or something like that because he just didn't anticipate USPS would, would back down from this plan. Well, I'll tell you what, it is interesting because I was in the room with uh, Mark and Jackie when, when we had... Um, asked the uh, Postal Service to come in and talk to us about this issue, and they could not answer any question uh, as to why it was happening. They had no, there's no data, there's no reason. They couldn't explain it, but they were still adamant moving forward. So I can understand Mark's surprise. Um, and, and at, but here's the other thing. Nevada was not the only state that was dealing with this. We had senators from other states uh, that had the same concerns and issues, whether they were Republican or Democrat. So this was really a pushback on the Postal Service to say, what are you doing? And show us the data. Show us why this is necessary. And if you can't, then don't do it. And I think they had a lot of pressure, not just from Nevada. I'd like to think it was just Nevada alone. And I, I, I will tell you, it was Jackie who led um, on the Senate side on this issue. But it was great that they finally realized this just doesn't make sense. Uh, and they were listening to us as we, and I think many of my colleagues across the country, were complaining about it. Before we go, I want to ask you about two ballot questions that Nevadans will be voting on in November. First one, question three, ranked choice voting, open primaries. It passed two years ago. It's going to be on the ballot in November and would change the Constitution. A lot of people see that as a way to uh, revolutionize, really, how our electoral system is run and, and People see it as kind of a threat to the political institutions, if you will. Why are you opposed to that? I don't see what they're trying to fix. I, I'm all about fixing uh, problems where there's, and finding solutions. I'm not sure what they're trying to fix here. We are a swing state. We elect Republicans and we elect Democrats. I'm not sure why these, out of, let me just say, out-of-towners have come in to our, the state of Nevada to try to change and bring this ranked, uh, this ranked choice uh, voting. Not only that, it's very complex and confusing. Uh, and why do we make voting for people so confusing when it should be easier? Our goal is to make sure everybody has that opportunity to vote, pick their candidate that they want, elect that candidate. Boom. And, and, and we have been fighting and I've been fighting to make sure we're in a state that makes it e easy for people to vote in a safe, secure manner that, that is accessible for them. That's exactly what we should be doing, not <laughs> putting more difficulty and complexity uh, in the process. Supporters will say, we rank choice uh, things every day. You know, these are my favorite fruits. These are my top three restaurants I want to go to. Um, what, what about that is so confusing that worries you? Yeah, well, what's the solution we're trying to, what, what are we trying to fix here? What's the solution we're trying to address? It would be the problem that, we're trying to address. you know, a fraction of the electorate is choosing the nominees. You know, it's, say it's 10% of, of the Republican voters are, are picking their nominee, 10% of Democratic voters picking their nominee because so many people are shut out of the primary as nonpartisan voters. Then just have open primaries. So you're supportive of Oh, yeah, I've said that I'm open okay. for open primaries. But yeah. what I have seen is they're hiding this ranked choice between, <laughs> behind saying, oh, this is about, this ballot initiative is about open primaries. And it's not. Hmm. It's about ranked choice. Yeah. You want to open that door to uh, having in a primary people be able to elect whomever, whatever party they come from, then just have open primaries in the state. Okay. Well, you, hopefully you'll be watching our question three debate coming up in uh, in October. Uh, last one, voter ID. Where do you stand on that? You know, this is uh, this is another one that I've seen as, particularly as the attorney general of the state, uh, there is this 
there's this misinformation that somehow there's a, this voter fraud that is happening, whether it's voter fraud or registration fraud. I did not see that as attorney general. I still do not see it. It's, again, um, some sort of a solution in search of a problem that does not exist in this state. Uh, my only other concern here is that, again, it goes back to we are trying to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to exercise their constitutional right to vote. And by actually making voter IDs, you're limiting it to some people who may not have access to IDs, and you're limiting their ability to vote. Why would we want to do that other than we're trying to shape an outcome for a certain advantage. So uh, again, I, I don't see what this is trying to solve. Uh, as you well know, I just uh, have worked with our Secretary of State as Attorney General in the past, and it's true to today. People can vote. Our voting system is safe, it's secure, and it's accessible. And uh, I think that's where we should spend our time and money to ensure that that continues for folks in the state of Nevada. Last one, I'll put you on the spot here. What's your favorite restaurant in all of Nevada? Because you travel the whole state in this role. Oh, you're, Pick no, one. that's too tough. I cannot do that. <laughs> I will tell you, um, Nevada has some of the best food uh, in the country from different cuisine right that's different a politician cultures. answer though, i'm telling really. you because i'm a, it's like music i don't have yeah. one one fa favorite genre of music it's sure. true for food too and that's the best part of nevada I, I will say this we used to be particularly in southern nevada the buffet capital of the world that yeah. has changed yeah. that has changed now people come here just for the cuisine and that's a great thing to see for nevada well, it's a good reminder that i need to get back down to southern nevada and check out some more of it but Thank you so much for coming by, Senator Cortez Masto. We really appreciate it. It has been an honor and a pleasure. And um, enjoy the rest of your time in Nevada before you head back to D.C. Thank you, Ben.